if you listen to this podcast and see the video, I think Mark and I, we touch upon some amazing um, journeys, if you will, from um, stories around the world, whether we are going to Uganda, to New York, uh, where we're happening in, in Europe, where we live both, we live we're both in the same city, we have similar thoughts, but I really learned a lot uh, in, from your inspiring questions and uh, from, I wish the listeners have the time to spend to, you know, engage and see their potential and think a little bit more like moonshots and learn about butterflies and how a metamorphosis of our world can basically lift us all up. Today I have a very special guest, Harold Neidhart. Um, he's a curator and CEO of Future in Future IO Institute, uh, which I'm also a faculty member of, and we've been friends for a long time. So I, I don't know how, how much depth and substance I'm going to get into his biography because it's absolutely very long. But Harold is passionate about meaning and technology, the future of exponential technologies and its opportunities for society, ec economy, and entrepreneurs especially in Europe. Together with a select group of inspiring futurists, faculty, leading innovators, and creative minds, he has launched the Future IO Institute as a new platform and community for European innovation leaders to help co-create a vision for desirable futures. Very de near and dear and passionate to my heart. Um, he also, Founded and started MLove has created an unconventional event series that brings together innovators and inspiring events at amazing locations around the world, mainly Europe, uh, since 2009. And throughout his career, he has been a digital pioneer, serial startup founder in Europe and in the United States. He's published two books. One I have here, Moonshots for Europe. Um, I'm also in this book, fabulous book, and we'll touch a little bit on the story of that. And Lifestyles of Mobility, and Harold has a copy there. He can hold up as well. Uh, yeah, yeah, beautiful white book, Lifestyle of Mobility, uh, written together with acclaimed innovators and change makers. Harold uh, is a Singularity University alumni and has spoken on innovation at events all around the world, including TEDx, Hong Kong, Hamburg, Marrakesh, spoken at South by Southwest in Austin, Texas, Singularity U uh, Summit in Netherlands and in Germany, Wired, uh, the next Mobile World Congress in four years from now in Barcelona, and as a speaker at numerous corporate and executive events all around the world. Harold is an advisor to the United Nations Climate Change Secretariat on Resilient Frontiers. He also, as well as um, Future IO Institute, helped usher in some amazing things with Resilience Frontiers and, and moonshot thinking and modeling and is also a member of the Digital Economy Workgroup of the World Economic Forum in Davos. So I, I probably have left some things out, uh, but uh, uh, it's kind of like for me as well, there's a lot to go into. We're, we're not young youngsters anymore. We've been around the block and seen our fair share. Uh, did I leave anything out? First of all, thank you so much, Mark, for having me. It's a pleasure and uh, being part of your world uh, has been a tremendous ride for me. Um, you have helped um, me and the Institute in, in having amazing introductions to especially the UN and some of your friends there. So uh, it's just a privilege to hang out with you. Thank you, Harold. You're a good friend and I, I do it because I believe in you and I believe in future IO and your visions of what you create. So I'm glad to have you along. It's a lot, it's a lot funner journey when we can do it together uh, uh, with people you trust and you, you love and who, who you can create beautiful things with. So I thank you. Um, that that kind of leads into 
we do have a history together. I think we're going on 10 years now that uh, we've known each other. And, you know, last four years, we've been doing some active, uh, active events and things together, trying to work uh, more and more together. The UN and World Economic Forum, obviously, are, are two big ones, but we, we had a great ride in um, 2019, was it, or 2018, uh, we went to Songdo. 2019, we went to Songdo in the uh, first quarter of the year um, for the National Adaptation Plan Expo and Resilience Frontiers Workshop. Um, Tell us a little bit about wh what your experience was, uh, your viewpoint being drawn into that experience and how, how it was and, and what your thoughts, e even about Resilience Frontiers. I don't think a lot of people know what it is or where it's going. Yeah, I think that is a tremendous topic. Um, we all should uh, spend more time on this. Um, obviously, the sustainability, uh, <clears throat> United Nations Sustainability Goals. And um, well, uh, from your connections and uh, we could invite uh, some speakers of the UN to our future IO events. We had um, t uh, meetings in Bonn where actually the world headquarter of the fight against climate change is in Bonn, Germany. So who would have thought? Um, it's probably a group of, I would figure, less than 500 people and I could go on about that like, well, isn't that like the best 20,000 scientists in the world all hanging out together and uh, doing good things? Well, it's 500 people. But from those, there's amazing, you know, uh, people in there who help, you know, the global dialogue. And so um, they helped invite us, you, me, and a couple of our uh, friends from the faculty for facilitation, as well as um, uh, a futurist who is in, in Korea from our group, Benjamin. Um, and we could spend a week there uh, on the Global Adaptation Week where um, people from especially member states, so politicians, policymakers, but especially in our group, we had about 100, 100 plus people which spent a whole week on moonshot thinking. And what was so striking is, well, first of all, they invited us to lead this workshop together with people from the University of uh, Honingen in, in the Netherlands. Um, on um, basically mudra thinking and a slash over to uh, future literacy, if you will. And um, it was so fascinating to see how um, they say, oh, innovation is a cool thing. It's not only for nerds. There's something new about, you know, thinking around different corners, cross-pollinating ideas, and maybe we should apply that also to policy making. And, you know, you would think as, let's say, a citizen, isn't that what people do since 20 years? I mean, we all know these challenges and, uh, you know, there's institutes for future thinking uh, also around the world um, since a couple of times, especially in Silicon Valley. But, um, you know, we were very privileged in that sense to really have sort of a first time that they kind of opened up to us and a group of these, you know, 100 people from around the world, which were invited very diverse from architects to, you know, artists or rainforest uh, warriors, let's say, um, in a good sense, meaning replantation. And uh, it was just a, uh, an amazing view to see how we could, you know, and, and light basically a room, but uh, basically let the group figure out where they want to go, what are different ideas, learn from each other. And that for me is always the magic. If you give some people insight, so, you had an amazing keynote talk to steer them up and you know, kind of rattle the cage and there were um, other people give insights. But most of all, we, we helped, you know, we guided them through a workshop and, and thinking on, a, on another level, on another level, and a little bit higher and a little bit more crazy audacious, if you will, not crazy, but what if this would happen? And most people don't really see so far still, let's say the impact of technology and how some of the things which, yeah, I heard this since 10 years, nothing is happening. And then within a year or so, all of a sudden stuff explodes. So that exponential curve, as you know, is something that is very foreign to a lot of people. So once you, but once you put them in a room and say, well, this is the room where all of this is allowed, all of a sudden you see that like this room literally expand and, you know, it, it's part of a center of the universe for at least that week. And it was really rewarding that, this was the beginning of the journey, so the resilient frontiers. So you can also look it up at the UNFCCC website. 
is a, a new journey which um, the climate change secretariat in Bonn is, is going on and basically say, well, we are already on a journey for the 10 year solving the you know, SDGs and uh, can we solve climate crisis in 2030? Well, there is a little bit of a, let's say, potential that we might not reach them. So how can we start a policy process and uh, getting insights to these policymakers that, well, what is the program after 2030? Well, you know, if we either not achieve it or if we reach a state which is hopefully has a, you know, fruitful uh, way of, of going from there now to the next level, well, what is the next level? And these discussions take time. The, the, the opinions shape, uh, shaping takes time. Bringing new people and opinions in is a, is a long process. And then if you have an opinion, then you have to you know, go inside the UN, up and down, then you have to go to all the member states, up and down. So all that process when you know, maybe there's a new COP, I don't know, 35 or so in 10 years from now, when a new idea is ratified, all this process maybe takes five to 10 years. So we are in this process and we've been invited to continue some of these discussions and um, well, you know, COP26 in Glasgow is not happening this year. So we're looking forward to next year and hopefully it gives us even us and, and everybody, the world basically more time to say, well, let's make it more meaningful because we have seen that everybody knows the Paris Agreement, but after that, there was, it's not every year that you have like this, oh, amazing breakthrough and now everybody's doing it. They say, ah, we sign it. And then there's three years of, well, I didn't know that we had to start right away. It's somehow sometime down the route, <laughs> down the yeah, line. Exactly. So as a citizen, it's sometimes frustrating. It's like, why, you know, it's happening. So um, it's very rewarding to say, okay, there's a little bit of a foot in the door to help shape this process and have, you know, a humble insights of, you know, what technology and even behavioral shifts and new business models can maybe, can we adapt that in a positive way towards, you know, desirable futures, including the sustainability goals for, you know, our kids, basically, and, and uh, you know, the rest of our uh, lifetime on this beautiful planet that is so nicely depicted behind you. Yeah, it's depicted behind us both. So your your strong focus is Europe. My strong focus is a little bit more the, the 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 overlook of uh, overview effect or the cosmic perspective. Yeah. I believe you know um, this is our World Bank. It's not some physical location. It's what you see behind me and behind yeah. you. That's where we get all our resources from. Um, that that was so eloquently said, and and um, I really need to kind of hone in and nudge you you normally you don't even discuss maybe we we might not make it because the the premises of the uh, sustainable development goals and resilience frontiers is actually with that in mind we have achieved all 17 sustainable development goals the the 2030 agenda and then there's a nice infrastructure or springboard so to say to 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 2050 to spring yep. off into this resilient uh, frontiers, this resilient desirable futures, which was really the moonshot or vision we, we tried to instill at everyone there. Let's reach this, let's start to plan. And, and it, it was a real big success. And, and in uh, November at COP25 in Madrid, which was also a very chaotic COP because at first it was supposed to be in Santiago, Chile. We were going to do something there. Then it got uh, canceled because of all sorts of reasons and moved to Madrid. And it was like put on last minute and kind of didn't turn out that good. But right beforehand, there was the turnover to all the inner agencies of Resilience Frontiers to all the UN inner agencies to, to take it over for the next years and for us to escort and, and accompany them on this process. Um, and then they launched at the COP25, this resilience uh, lab, which is was one of the coolest uh, booths and, and things at the COP25, uh, which was, was a real, real neat thing. And, and um, you were and speaking, then, right? Yeah, yeah, and I spoke there. And I think you, you've, you also since then have, have had a couple meetings with, um, UNF, Triple C, and, and also uh, with our contacts there as well. So there's some 
wonderful things going on there. But that's not, I mean, that that's just one of many projects, kind of humanitarian. Yeah. I have to jump in because, um, you know, just the last couple of days I saw a graph um, and, you know, why is it so important to work on these things? And uh, I mean, we have been around, we have seen the greens, you know, and, and the demonstrations, I don't know, 20 years ago in the 80s and so on and so forth. So, uh, but it has been very silent the last 20 years. It almost felt that we have been going down the, let's say, oh, it's a good life, you know, capitalism is great and so on. We all um, grow up and we don't have to really look at, at, the, at nature and, and future um, thinking so much in, in regards to the impact. But I think if you, I saw this graph and this really struck me um, that if we don't do anything, uh, we will probably end up in a four degree world um, in 2100, um, basically in 80 years from now. And 2100, if you like 2100, zero, zero, that like so sci-fi, it sounds Star Trek, it sounds like, well, that is like at least maybe, you know, five generations from me because this is I, uh, so unimaginable. But if you look at this number, um, and, and I looked at the chart, so basically your chart behind you, and um, all of Spain here behind me, Spain, uh, southern France, and Italy is basically already part of the Sahara in 80 years from now. If we don't do anything, this is the Sahara in, I mean, we both live in Hamburg. We never meet in Hamburg, but we both live here. So it's like, you know, eight hours down uh, by drive. You, you will be on the edge of the Sahara, excuse me. And that means that, um, you know, it's unlivable in 80 years from now. 80 years from now, that means, I mean, my daughters are 22 and 25. They will still be alive. And my future grandkids and your grandkids. And my grandkids, yes. They will live already in the world which is inhabitable in a lot of nice places where we want to go on, you know, vacation right now. I wish this year I could go, but well, this year is not in the cards with other reasons. So it's so, I mean, it's, it's the, the mind works perfectly in basically pushing all of these knowledges aside. And um, it's very hard to grasp, um, you know, future thinking, the, the idea of, well, what's beyond the next 18 months? You know, we, we obviously we see that we can be surprised within a week or two um, from, you know, life-changing events. Uh, we touch upon maybe that later, how, um, you know, in the world we live in right now. But it's, you know, most people have like, oh, my future is, well, next year I finally will go on vacation because this year is not. And maybe the lease of the car is off. And maybe, you know, there's a family event, a wedding of the, you know, aunt or the daughter or something like that. And that's sort of the time span. And then, well, and then if I, you know, basically stop working, you know, and retirement, then that's another life. But everything in between is sort of, you know, gooey, if you will. And I think we have to all be futurist, you know, and, and we are all futurists. We are futurists with every decision we make as a consumer, every decision we make as a citizen to vote, and every, you know, decision we make, whether we spend five minutes more on that letter or request in a corporate environment, like, oh, you know, somebody claimed we should be better in, in you know, sustainability and maybe our, the smoke from our <laughs> tower up there should be uh, not diesel, should be something else. So you can either push it aside and say, yeah, let's do it next year. Or you say, well, no, okay, I think this is the time. The time is clicking, ticking. And that's, I mean, what I love about your talk so much that you make this very vivid in uh, big pictures and videos and uh, atomic bombs going off. But literally, <laughs> it's um, something which has to strike much more. And that's, I, I, I mean, I think we also have to become all more political, if you will. We have to discuss this not only at our, you know, friends tables, but we have to engage more and, um, I mean, we see what's happening if we vote for politicians who are uh, maybe on the Western um, side in the Americas right now, uh, not doing a good job. And people are more complacent in, you know, should I vote or not? Nothing is happening. Well, no, your vote counts. And, well, I can go on and on. But I, I felt, um, you know, obviously this, this whole um, addition of thinking sustainable has been part of... Um, my life a long time, but it has not been so explicit like now as part of the Future Institute and with, you know, again, the friendships I owe you and the introductions 
to this uh, world because I think we can, um, you know, technology people have been driving the whole way for the last, you know, two decades or, or three, since 30 years and say, okay, faster, higher, better, cheaper, and so on and so forth. And um, we have to bring this back in the balance. And, you know, that's basically what the, my passion is. But, we we uh, really have. Except I had to just put it no, in. No, that's thing. fine. We, we, I'm glad you did. So there, I, I don't want to do the doom and gloom and um, we're behind the, we're behind the eight ball. We're uh, behind on, on some actions in some respects, but also uh, at the beginning of this year, as you, you were also on the, the road to Davos and did DLD and, and things. And we, um, we, we kind of saw that now we've taken some steps and placed our feet firmly on this exponential roadmap to achieving the goals. And that really hasn't ended. It's uh, only continued. And there's been some real positive things that, you know, that I wanted to touch on as well. I, I, I wanted to go more into some of the other projects because the UN isn't the only one that you do. You do a lot of other really positive projects around the world. One is a, a promise hub and you've done some, some others uh, with your uh, container project a while back. And, and um, so you, you've always been in this direction one way or the other to help and give back and to, to ease uh, global suffering and kind of help solve our global grand challenges in one way or another, which I, I think is very noble. Um, because you've, you've kind of went into, we've got to act in that. Uh, I'm going to throw, this is a perfect time to throw in some things that we've just discussed before that is important for, for our listeners. I think, I think you know that, you know, if we're wondering if sustainability or environmental social governance or the sustainable development goals are a better business model, or if that's the future that, that gets us to 2030, then really during this pause, all we have to do is look towards some really indicators. If you're talking to a board, if you're talking to your clients who you advise, um, it always comes down to profits and money. What do you tell the shareholders? What are we going to say? And well, the proof is in this. Look towards the New York Stock Exchange, the NASDAQ, the S&P 500, the S&P Global, Stocks Europe, 600 Benchmark, Collar Capital, the Nikkei Index, the Goldman Sachs and HB, uh, HSBC Research Reports. And I could probably go on for many, many more not only the last quarter of last year, the first quarter of this year and moving into the next quarter, um, sustainable index funds lost less than conven conventional index funds. Seven out of 10 sustainability, uh, sustainable equity funds finished in the top halves uh, of their conventional index funds. Um, also in the top half of their Morningstar categories and 24 out of 26 environmental, social and governance titled index funds outperform their closest conventional counterparts. The proof is in the money. Public tra publicly traded companies who have taken this uh, divestment or sustainability seriously seem to significantly outperform markets across various geographies. Fossil fuels are truly stranded assets and Goldman Sachs says the only other commodity looking as precarious as oil is livestock. So ESG uh, risk factors leave companies really exposed and vulnerable. And so um, it's nice that we have warm hearts and ethics and we can see the future that is sustainable. But really, I don't know if you agree to this, doesn't it always come down to our clients or those who we consult or we work with is, do they have the budget? Is there a return for them immediately or quickly by doing this? Um, here's the proof, right? In yeah, just, totally. just, just one respect. Um, I, one, one other one that uh, you will probably mention um, that I want to ask you about. Have you ever heard Earth Overshoot Day or me speak about that at all? Of course. So there, there's the biggest proof. Uh, Probably coming uh, up in another well, week or so. 
<laughs> no, uh, uh, last year it was July 29th was Earth yeah. Overshoot Day, the day we went beyond our finite resources. And because of this pause, this great reset, this, this stop, it got moved up to August 22nd. So we almost gained 32 right. something days. Unbelievable, right? Unbelievable. Really so, amazing. so, so um, there's proof all, all around us. And, um, you know, I, I, I really didn't want to get into that, that, that quickly, but that, that, that was where you're going and the positive results that we're seeing from that, that everybody's been waiting for. Where, where can we see it now? Okay, that we've had enough excuses. We've seen the results. It's a better business system. Let's do it. Yeah. In, in going back now to, to, to what I was asking you is tell us about Promise Hub or maybe some of these other projects you, you've been working on and the positive things that have happened over the years. And then we're going to get into a little bit more of the, 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 the great pause and reset that we've had and what, what you've experienced. Um, I, I'd love to delve into these aspects. I think there is a, I have to start zooming back. Um, please, please do. 12 years. Yeah. Uh, because in 2008, I was the first time at Burning Man. And whoever was at Burning Man knows exactly that if you were there the first time in the desert, like eight hours off of San Francisco, somewhere in Nevada, it is such an amazing feeling of uh, community, of you know, culture, of art, of it's a different world. For one week, you are, you know, in 2008, it was literally also you're offline, you're in the desert, nothing happens there. Um, they actually had to have their own rig for communication. And so now it's Instagram all over the world. So uh, the, the, it's a little bit different, but it changed so much my life that I basically started MLove as a community for you know, innovation within my industry, which was mobile by the time. And uh, this was going on a you know, exponential curve, but I felt, well, we have to have some sort of community sense in our industry that we can exchange ideas and be more you know, vulnerable, if you will, but more open uh, in a way. So I started that uh, with, with really some good friends and which, who nudged me and said, no, why don't you do it? You know, you know so many people. And so, so it, it started small, always in nice locations as castles. Um, I have a thing for castles. I do too. And, um, great. and the first time, uh, basically, so I gathered some friends from the mobile industry and I said, well, I, I think we should do something different here at the castle. There is actually not a good Wi-Fi. There's no, um, you know, and electricity was even spotty. It's south of Berlin. Now it's really nice, but um, it was early days. So in, I was in Barcelona speaking to a friend and said, I wish I had a container with like a solar panel and we can bring, you know, power in and show how uh, mobile really not only our cell phones are, but how mobile the world is. He said, yeah, actually I own part of shares of a company like that. Why don't we bring a container? So on the very first Amlove um, Con Festival was a mix between, let's say, festival ideas and a little bit of Burning Man and a conference. Um, so we had this container running our Wi-Fi with solar panels and the wind turbine. And uh, so from that moment on, containers became sort of a theme. And um, a year, two years later, we had an empty container and we said, well, you know, what if we can develop a school in a box? So this is an empty container, an empty vessel for ideas. So we had workshops running with, you know, I had um, people visual artists from America imported, which I met at South by, and it has been a, a fantastic group of people, which is so rewarding to be part of. Um, so we had this school in a box idea, and a friend of mine, Arpa, um, he shares the same hairdresser from Finland. He's like, <laughs> I'm building, <laughs> I'm building um, you know, a school in a box, basically on a mobile phone. His company, Funzi, is amazing with, uh, and very engaging in Africa in uh, you know, e-learning mobile learning idea. And um, so we had some of these ideas and they became sort of, you know, part of a back burner. I was like, yeah, one of those days. Okay, so this then a couple of years later, 2015, all of a sudden, well, first of all, you know, part of this container idea, we brought a container to a fair in Barcelona, um, which we helped uh, start four years from now and advising the fair of Barcelona and the Catalonian 
government, so to say, it was um, very good ride as well. And um, so we had always containers in Barcelona. We had a cool booth. So it was nice. And I always dreamt about a campus of say, well, why don't we have a couple of containers, ideally south of Barcelona in the sun and have sort of a, you know, hippie collective of people. Now we would call it co-working space. And um, so doing that, um, we had this in our mind. And then um, we actually started to build, it, uh, instead of Barcelona, we built it in Hamburg. So 2015, part of a smart city initiative, we, um, we started to build a, com a container campus. It was like 33 containers with some startups, you know, mobility startups. And um, then, you know, summer of 2015, the uh, climate crisis um, basically became the migration crisis, became uh, a lot of refugees running towards north and uh, also hanging out in Hamburg. And um, with a friend from Cisco, we basically, so cut a long story short, so okay, why don't we build a container and a container clinic? Because one of the things people need is health, you know, checking of the, if they're dehydrated. I mean, some had, you know, wounds from different um, traumas uh, from either from Syria and so on. So we said, okay, let's enable a container within two weeks. Um, let's say, no, it was, uh, it was actually six weeks, but four weeks we had to wait for the physical container. Once the physical container was there, within two weeks we built a clinic in there and then um, uh, it was gifted to the city of Hamburg and the university clinic. And um, one of the clues was to bring in not only, let's say, all the hygiene and the, you know, the, the furniture, but also a terminal where we could have uh, more than 50 languages um, within a video uh, terminal. So telemedicine, if you will, five years ago. And um, it was great impact. Um, what this first container actually found its way to Samos, where we brought it uh, to a refugee camp there, which is often, unfortunately, in, in TV when it's burning or overflowing. Yeah. Um, another one is in Lebanon, where I had the privilege to walk into, you know, uh, a refugee camp with this 100 million people, uh, sorry, 1 million people, uh, Beka Valley, you know, I don't know, 20 miles from Syria, very, I don't know, another story. Um, but there's like two containers at least there, which are active, and there's has been then 10 donated uh, for Hamburg. So now the container has been in there. And uh, through a friend, uh, when I was at Singularity Global Summit in the US, we could present an idea of the clinic. And then a friend, now a friend, and then said, uh, you know, Dave approached me and said, hey, can we not do a school in a container? I said, ah, school in a box. Well, there was this whole idea. Yeah, of course we can do it. Um, so sometimes I think that's a little bit of a learning. You, you have an idea and it's a marathon. You know, yes, sometimes ideas are quick and you can do lean and sprint and, you know, within two weeks, amazing stuff. Sometimes it takes just five years or more. And um, so he was amazed by the idea and he helped, um, you know, co-fund uh, um, an initiative which is called Promise Up because of, you know, there's a whole story why the name, because we met a girl uh, in Lebanon called Promise. Um, which was in the camp. So we built a school and found, looked for a location where we want to build the first pilot school. And uh, we found through a friend, Mike, in Nakivale, which is one of the oldest refugee camps in Uganda. I think uh, it's more than 50 years old and um, there's 100,000 people there. Um, we built this house. First we said, oh, we bring in containers, it's going to be fast. But um, they said, no, container is no good because if you have a hook, that means you can bring it in fast, but you can also take it away. And we want to have a real building. So um, through um, our lovely project manager um, and let's say lady impresario of, of yeah. project yeah. Uh, Diana, um, she helped um, you know, basically talk with, the, with our local friends. And they said, well, we want something physical. And um, there was a house from plastic bottles and they said, well, what is that? Yeah, this is, uh, you know, we can build this. So basically look it up, promisehub.com. It's a, um, a round house. It's uh, the largest uh, bottle house built from recycled uh, plastic bottles. So you put some sand in it and this becomes the building bricks actually of the house. Um, so we not only could we recycle or the local team, but also kind of built something which everybody could contribute because all of a sudden became their house. Everybody had their hand on some of the plastic bottles to build it and now it's beautifully designed and, and painted and inside there's a couple of rooms, 120 square meters. And um, you know, we brought in computers and Wi-Fi. And um, so the amazing thing is that it's not 
a school that we teach. It's actually a center for entrepreneurs where they define and find their own passion and we encourage them. So we basically give them tools and encouragement, tools meaning access to digital you know, learning as well as digital platforms like payments and, and uh, so on. But it's more or less the encouragement, you know, check a couple of YouTube videos if, you know, there's maybe a passion you have and can you make this into a job? And um, we have seen, especially now in this, um, you know, COVID crisis also that their entrepreneurial mind also, you know, they're, they're doing masks and, and they are developing soap for, you know, hand hygiene. And if you speak with our friends there, they're like a walking TED talk. They're like, yeah, we don't have to do this and this. And it's amazing how you know knowledge spreads. And uh, if you combine that with passion and enable some of these, let's say, entrepreneurial minds to meet, all of a sudden you have a community and you build it, and that kind of grows. And so we have started this journey, I think now two years ago, um, was finding the place and then building the house. And um, it's, it's just an amazing journey. And we hope we can find more partners to kind of spread this around the world. And that looks quite good right now. So an amazing team and it's again so rewarding to see from you know your life journey there's like one event here which leads to this which has some ideas and then it, ideas evolves almost like a rubik's cube some of the ideas have been there and some of the I, um, some of the parts of it but sometimes you have to turn it and then all of a sudden you see it and then it's manifested in a you know school of all things so yeah it's it's beautiful because what happens is it's the promise hub. You've given them a promise, but through that they get empowered and they create something. So originally, like you said, it was supposed to be a container. Then it evolves into this beautiful big bottle house with uh, all sorts of um, a mecca hub spot around it of not only entrepreneurs and makers and crafts and art and um music and dance and giving people a promise and a hope and empowerment to create it themselves. And uh, I, I watched the journey. I'm also an advisor, thanks to you. Um, so we, we, we help each other on, on different projects, but how, where it starts out, you can see through the videos and the initial experiences where these people are like, well, what is this going to be? It sounds great, I promise, and I'm not sure if I have the skills or knowledge. But then you see them flower and just create amazing things and and turn into this, like, like you said, uh, uh, the walking TED Talks. They're running around after a few months saying, this is unbelievable, this is the best thing, and it's created new new promise and hope for the future, which is such a beautiful thing. Uh, we could go on with the other projects probably for hours. I just wanted to let our listeners know that uh, you've been doing this a long time where we're we're both kind of in old hands at this and that you have your hands and and many different things to to better the world, to better our future, to create these resilient, desirable futures. One aspect of that is uh, your your English is absolutely impeccable because you, lived in uh, New York and, and uh, as a German, you, you, um, you know, speak German and maybe a couple other languages, but you're uh, very well versed, but you are a global citizen. And what I want to know in, in some respects, not only because you've lived in other places and you travel a lot and interact with those, I want to know what your feelings and uh, thoughts are about being a global citizen, but how would you feel if that turned into a reality for every human being on earth? If we remove the borders, the walls, the limitations, what is your view and your understanding of this? And is it something that we're moving towards? Is it something that's happening? Has it already occurred? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, we lived in New York, actually, physically, our, I had the best of both worlds. We lived in New York for seven years, uh, 98 to 2004. So we saw the height of the, you know, dot com and startup uh, craze. I had the privilege to have an office in Soho downtown, you know, on Green Street between Prince and Spring. I mean, for a European, probably, uh, it, it's like the mecca of uh, cool and um, nice stores and stories. I mean, you know, all the 
old stories of Andy Warhol and all the artists and galleries, which now are more Chanel boutiques, uh, yeah. probably bought it up right now still. Um, so that was cool. And I actually lived even uh, in Connecticut. So I had like a very amazing life. We had maybe the smallest house there, but still it was a, a cool, cool, cool time. Uh, one of my daughters is born there and they both grown up. So the language luckily is even better with them. And um, that is, I think, what one thing we can, yeah, give, teach kids, uh, teach ourselves and learn is uh, the different perspective. The longer you are away from your own home, you see it with different eyes. And, um, you know, it was a long dream for me to spend time in the U.S., um, which I could. And with all of the, you know, some of the companies um, later I founded uh, were also, you know, based there. Um, so it, it has been a great ride. So. Global citizenship is something, for example, we in, in Europe, uh, let's say on a limited scale, part of a global um, idea. We have the Erasmus program where students can exchange, uh, go to other um, you know, universities to learn, spend a semester or two. Um, also, there were some ideas which I would really love is if people, once they the, um, you know, end their school, have a gap year and basically get a year you know, free train ticket and say, okay, you can go wherever you want on the trains, uh, especially in Europe and, and just have a different perspective. Go out, you know, you have to be alone, you, you, you know, get, get off um, your parents' uh, couch, so to say, make some adventures, make new friends and m have a much faster, you know, idea about that we all connected and that everybody has a different life and you can maybe combine it with some social work um, so that you, you actually have a more, not only a party life, but do you also touch base uh, with, let's say, some of the community where you're yeah. at in you know, southern France or Italy. Um, I think in the US, um, we see especially now, unfortunately, that uh, we could do more with education, with having a global view. I mean, especially maybe let's call it more the presidency rather than the people, because I have so many amazing friends which I miss. And uh, I, I just feel that right now is not the time, first of all, not the next two months anyway, to just go and hang out in the US. I mean, it's one of the most beautiful countries. It has much, some of my really deepest friends, uh, which I knew since years. And um, now let's say the presidency and, and this whole thing in Washington basically got out of hand. And I mean, they're actually refraining from the COP and from the climate, um, agreements. They're getting out of the, the WHO and don't want to work on the health organization and not even say, hey, we need to rejuvenate and, and let's say everybody can improve, even the, especially also the uh, WHO. But they just say, no, we're off. I mean, 21, we're, we're signing off, uh, we, the US. Um, so there's not a lot of that overview effect. And I think that at least had, for me, some spark. Um, that the COVID crisis we're in right now is something as an overview effect because all of a sudden we had the one thing which everybody had in common. The thing is that maybe even we see that the time shift now, even Bolsonaro has COVID and he was the biggest denier except for Trump. So there's some irony in that and uh, obviously hopefully he gets not sick from it, but um, we see that, I mean, this is a global effect and um, it trains a lot of smart people to say, wow, now we know that we have to better prepare for climate, for some of these challenges, even future pandemics. But there's even more people on the, let's say, side of the deniers which say, well, you know, hmm, it's just a virus, it's just a flu and will go away. And um, I think I, I lack, especially in the high times, we let, let uh, lack some of the leadership actually on a global level. The UN really was not like stepping in and say, wow, this is something, we actually bring the blue helmets in now, help the world to coordinate. It was, there was one picture, which is like an empty, you know, room of the Security Council. I mean, this is a big security threat. This is a health threat. This is a global, you know, threat of ideas. On the other hand, there is this tiny chance, as you saw, say, with the overshoot day, that, that climate could actually learn from it well if we don't drive so much if trucks and ships and especially cruise ships and so on uh, are driven less there is an effect we can see so this has to be also a learning effect and um, so i feel that um, if you are already a global citizen you are just reinforced in your view and say wow this has to be even more 
um, as a feeling and as a you know data for everybody to see. On the other hand, it's so um, sad to see that um, I think we have to do so much more that giving that global perspective and 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 frame it. At the same time, I mean, at the height of COVID, almost um, the Americans uh, or let's say Elon and NASA, um, Elon Musk shoot the. Um, uh, the new form of a space shuttle up there. The dragon, the, yeah. uh, the dragon. Um, and um, this was also a good moment in a way. It, it definitely brought some people in, 10 million people on YouTube, I think, uh, streaming this, seeing in a way a little bit of that global overview effect. And um, But it, I think, you know, sometimes I feel that we need a new narrative um, on a global level. And it Right now, the narrative only comes from politicians, and if they are strong, great. If they are so so, okay. It becomes more like um, you know, let's a tweet or or some propaganda or a short video. I think um, even the EU didn't really show a lot of leadership in the height of it. It's, you know, it broke down into national states. It even broke down into counties or states uh, within countries, and you know, putting up borders. I mean, what's that? So I think we could have done a better job, at least within Europe, and say, hey, if people have it in France and so on, I mean, you can have local lockdowns, maybe like we see in, in a small town in Germany. Like yeah. now. Um, and that's OK, but there has to be a better cohesion on, uh, well, how do we solve these things on a more regional multi-state multi level? Um, and that's you know, still my hope. We have to all go in and, and see if we can influence some of the politicians and some of our people and partners to, you know, think more on a global level. But I mean, you and me, we say, hey, it's all there. Exactly. Look, we all see it. We're all part of this. Um, you, we are the global citizens and uh, we have to think and feel more. And so I think we have the data. We have to feel the future. We have to feel that we are part of it and that we have a agency. And that's, you know, in a way, my mission or our mission to say, can we spread the word and bring more people into feel that they've been part of that journey. The, the agency and empowerment to feel like a global citizen. Uh, I, for a long time, I, I've known that the World Trade Organization and businesses really been acting as global citizens, global players, regardless of uh, the nations and borders that we've built up. And it's been functioning that way in, in many respects. The, you, you, you broach a, a sensitive uh, subject uh, that's kind of has a ripple effect to many others, and that's the, the COVID-19, the, the coronavirus. Um, we have a, a mutual friend in, in uh, Helsinki, Finland, uh, Mika Lainonen, and uh, over the times, many times you've said before, you know, to unify us as a world, we need, we need an alien invasion or we need an alien to, to kind of bring the humanity together to rally around a cause or a solution. And so we, we didn't have an alien, but we've had a virus, which is really a spinoff of the, the seasonal flu and SARS and MERS and, and this uh, pushing forward of that it's, and it's really the, the the root of it is is a climate issue that's uh, created through uh, humans encroaching on certain areas and bringing viruses out of the soils and we can see it's also it's very much tied to the seasonal flu it happens in a certain time and, um, and it should go away eventually I don't want to go too much into the controversy of that because I believe it's truly a wonderful time to have a pause and a reset to get us on that new path. And, and we have a plan um, for that. I want to know how, as a, a nomad, as a futurist, as someone who's thinking about this and doing moonshots, how have you weathered during this time? What has it been? And, uh, I, I think, you know, you also touched upon your time in New York. There was something that happened there that that um, has maybe made you more resilient or also given you some learnings that you can take away and have applied during this time. And I'd like to kind of get an update on how, how that's been and, and what your plan is going forward. Yeah. Well, yeah, you touched upon New York. I mean, uh, not seeing only the high days uh, or the heydays of uh, the dot-com, but also the dot-com bubble bursting. 
uh, but especially also 9-11. Um, so I was in New York, I was at, literally on 42nd Street and 5th Avenue seeing one of the towers uh, crumble. And that was really uh, remarkable, let's say, in, in, in so many words and so many aspects of um, this. We I had a startup at the time, we lost, uh, I don't know, within the next 10 days, we had, I don't know, we had $250,000 in the books within 10 days after 9-11, all of that vanished, uh, you know, there was a fax coming in with sort of a X into it and say, sorry, this man is no longer here. Uh, the marketing uh, person who signed it is off and so on. So it was not only a financial um, you know, disaster, it was also in, in different aspects of uh, health and so on. So um, we, we stayed on in America, but um, basically I had to change industry. I mean, personally, we're like, hey, um, 9 I mean, there was 2000 was NASDAQ crashed, 9-11 uh, was in 2001. So within a year or let's say 12 months, you, you went from amazing internet goes all the way up and I was really at the you know, frontier of that to, well, the internet was overrated in a way, advertising is <clears throat> gone, any kind of new ideas are gone. So, <clears throat> sorry, I had to switch industry. I was actually, it was a fun uh, part as well in the end, but it was a two year stint in raising an ice cream franchise from Europe in America. But literally the, the idea on the understanding that, well, you are useless in your industry where at the, you know, just a week before you were at the forefront of new innovation. We worked for Procter & Gamble worldwide for Museum of Modern Art. We worked for uh, amazing uh, projects and then was a startup, worked for all the big fragrance industries, Coty and, uh, you know, Chanel and Estee Lauder. I mean, it was like in New York working for these prestigious brands. It was sort of the top of the pops. But within a week, it's like, no, that's all gone. You need to, you know, go back in line and think about something new. That, in a way, prepared me to be faster, if you will. I mean, involuntarily. And so when this crisis hit after the financial crisis 2008, um, it's something of a deja vu. And the others say, okay, we have to, the hardest part is to motivate yourself so that you can help motivate others and be, a little bit of a flag and say, well, this is what we have to uh, think about now. Um, and I, I, you know, try to coin it more like the metamorphosis um, rather than a transformation. We have talked about digital transformation for the last, I mean, maybe five years. And for me, digital transformation is uh, really only a investment you know, how do you say, a lack of investment over the last 20 years. I think I had my first email address, I just thought, in 85. So a lot of us have been digital for a long time and you feel like, oh, people talk about, oh, I think we have to do digital now. It's the internet is not going away. Yes, uh, hello, wake up. So I think digital transformation is more or less, a, you know, a reaction and of not investing the last 10 or 20 years in small you know, small bets and digital. Now, all of a sudden you have to play catch up, invest so much time, change your organization. You see it at Volkswagen. We have to be now a software company and, and find 5,000 people to build an operating system and all move to Wolfsburg, Wolfsburg which is, uh, you know, nowhere yeah. you want, wants to live unless you just want to work and have a nice time. It's a nice countryside, but that's it. So impossible <clears throat> job, but I think, uh, COVID shows us that we have to think even more radical. So we have to think about a butterfly and say, well, we have been a caterpillar. We are in the state of goo right now in our cocoon. We actually literally have been in our cocoon at home. Some of us had the chance to read all the books we ever wanted to read and uh, so on. Um, as an entrepreneur, you're never really on the side like a maybe somebody is who are forelearned. You, you are actually with one foot always, you know, <laughs> out of your company, but it's like, oh no, what's the, in? they have to switch to the next industry and with one foot you are like hustling. So uh, my time has been a little bit more busy than, uh, than usually, actually super busy with eight Zoom calls a day and I wish uh, this is going Same away. Same with me, yeah. That, that cocoon <laughs> stage is the, the gooey stage. It's almost a, not only just a disruption, but it's, um, burning your bridges behind you and you actually cannibalize yourself. So that cocoon and that gooey transformation from cocoon yeah. to caterpillar cocoon to, to butterfly is really um, where we're at. There's no going back. There's nothing to go back to. Yes. 
And you know, our mission is moonshots, right? Moonshot thinking, uh, moonshots for Europe is sort of our main focus, although we go more global in our approach now. Um, the idea of, let's say, moonshots um, is, is people understand, ah, in, in you know, 69, 50 years ago, 51 years ago, we touched you know, the, the man on the moon, actually on the 20th of Jan, uh, July coming up, my mom's birthday. So um, the, the um, and moonshot in a way could be a very technical term. And some people say, yeah, it's very American. And, you know, it's not, and it's only technical. It doesn't have anything. But if you combine the notion of this technical innovation steam we, we were writing literally the last decades, especially on inter exponential technologies and you know computer power and uh, now artificial intelligence, nanotech, biotech, AI, robotic, all of these things are on this amazing curve, which is so hard to grasp, but th that's the main driver. And we see it on the stock market, as you said earlier, that the big winners are the Googles and the Amazons and uh, Apple and Microsoft of the world and Tesla. Um, so now if you combine the, the technical notion with sort of this nature approach of a butterfly where the butterfly or the caterpillar has no DNA structure so doesn't even know that it becomes a, a butterfly and we are in that thing in the middle, hopefully we can develop no, and a lot of us will, ah, I want to go back to be a caterpillar. No, we have to go through that hard stage we're in and I think literally for the next months, we're in COVID, but for the next probably you know year or two, we will be in another state where you know economic um, hardship will come, as well as now new ideas a little bit harder because corporates cut the innovation budgets instead of just going the other way around. I mean, Americans are showing us they're doubling down. Um, Amazon said, "Hey, we're investing four billion dollars in to make the most uh, clean, high-tech delivery um, stage." Um, and, and on the other same day, you know, some of the German automobile companies said, oh, we're cutting people, we're cutting investment, we are, we're actually refraining to be a caterpillar, we're not going the next wave. So I think we have to really open our minds to say, we what is our dream of being a caterpillar? What's the dream of our desirable futures? What is, how do we want to live? What's the future we want for our kids? And then if you have that idea, that North Star, that moonshot idea, well, how do we go around and say, well, what are, if we know where we are going, what's our compass, what's our North Star? Well, what is the steps, the next two steps we can do the next two weeks and the next two years? And we have to start with many steps towards that goal. But if we don't have a goal, rather than going back to the future, back to the, you know, to whatever we were, it's not happening. So we have to develop this um, view to the future. And um, I have gotten, you know, some calls during this time with some friends um, in the, um, the companies we work with and they have been active. They have been, you know, oh, let's do something. I mean, with some of our company partners, we launched uh, Innovation for Now, a platform for where, where other corporates help corporates with, you know, special rebates, going digital and so on, just having that extra inch. And um, so that was really cool to see, you know, what kind of energy is there. And on the other hand, people called me and say, well, I had to let go of my agencies but the one thing I keep is working on purpose because we know once we go through this, um, we have to have a bigger purpose um, driven mission. We know that, uh, as you say, the capital markets are looking at it as well as especially our, the war for talent for young people, for the people who are in our company, the, the you know, meaningful work and meaningful purpose of a company becomes even more important in the future to you know, lead us into companies which now have to transform, you know. Um, Airbus, some of our closest friends here in Hamburg, um, you know, they have to let go of 5,000 people in Germany alone, 20,000 worldwide. And is Airbus now becoming a metal shop and say, well, we can build other machines uh, which help the world or will they become an electric, um, you know, plane manufacturer? Or will they just say, oh, we weather the storm and then, you know, hopefully in two years, everybody buys the same airplanes again. Well, that's probably not the case. So I can go on and on and we are, I think, getting... Um, but yeah, that, that, that's part of this uh, transition and how you've weathered it. I'm glad to hear that during this time, you you had some, some who are, I'm also familiar with uh, clients and those who you advise have contacted you and said that this 
the moonshot workshops, this finding the purpose and your vision for the future, creating these resilient, desirable futures that, um, that that's where, that's what will give them the resilience as a company. It's a new paradigm, a new business model to get them to the future, to weather storms like this. This will not be the last, uh, we will experience others. And you, you know, you talked about 2100, 20, um, but uh, we're going to see a lot more up until that time. Uh, with the airline industry, um, I have family all over the world. You have friends all over the world. I have business colleagues and that. I, I will continue to work and travel around the world as well. But I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt, by 2025, our, our aviation industry if, uh, has been working since 1945, 48, something like that uh, with the United Nations. There's a specific United Nations agency that uh, um, Corsia, the carbon offsetting um, the sustainable initiative agenda, something like that. Uh, it's a carbon offsetting scheme and proposal to transition to the future of flight and renewable flights and, and carbon offsetting. That's been in place a long time, but January 2019 for all airlines, it was uh, required that they do certain carbon offsetting. Delta was one that came in and, and this January this year and said by March 1st, we're gonna be carbon neutral and do carbon offsetting and innovation. So that future is coming regardless of we don't believe it, we do, we're worried, we don't understand it and it's, it's on an exponential curve and it needs to be because um, I'm not going to stand still and many others aren't either, we're gonna get cabin fever. Um, there is a way to enjoy the world and planet and be global citizens but to do it sustainably, to do it without impacting our environment and our planet. And that has to do with the business models. And this, this analogy that you gave of having this metamorphosis from caterpillar to cocoon to, to butterfly, there is no going back. And there are some that die in the cocoon stage, but there's other who get that struggle to get out. And through that struggle to get out of the cocoon is where they get their strength and, uh, and resilience to, to live on. And I really think that those companies that have heeded this transition for better business models and applying sustainability, environmental, social governance, this ESG into their business models, who've l listened to the workshops and, and discussions that you've had, they're really going to fare a, a, a lot better. The, the, the question, uh, I have is, is uh, the, the cocoon stage for me, in some respects, I don't know if this is a far stretch of, a, of, of analogy. Right now, we're in the social distancing and the mask phase, right? Yeah. We're, we're got to wear masks out, outside. And, and um, if we per push this personal protection equipment, which uh, was usually left for hospitals or people in certain construction trades or things to, to protect themselves for from air pollution or what, whatever it may be or, or in hospital scenarios. But if we push that model out into the future, um, what, what does it look like, you know? Um, so um, I guess this is the point where I ask you the burning question, WTF, and, and we both know it's not the swear word, but what's the future? If we push these current models out, What's that going to look like? Or do you have a clearer vision of WTF? Hmm. Well, <clears throat> I think um, I don't have a clear vision, I think, but I have a good feeling of, um, you know, what, what is there. And it's so complex that it's uh, really, okay, it's sort of a, you know, let, uh, Guy Kawasaki, who was a famous evangelist of Apple, basically coined the term when he built ecosystems and said, ah, we have to let a thousand flowers bloom. I think Mao said something like, we have to have a million flowers bloom. Um, so it was sort of a, <laughs> I don't know, acronym which jumped from capital, communism to capitalism. Yeah. But I think we, there's so many, let's say, ideas and pockets, and that's why it has also, it's not what's the future, what's desirable future. So it has an S, it's a plural thing. The future of people in Hamburg is different from people in Mumbai or Chile 
we see that uh, right now, you know, the world is already burning, our house is burning, and, and literally in Australia, in Chile, in um, California, even in on the border of Hamburg, uh, let's say Germany to the Netherlands a couple of months ago, there was, uh, you know, there's drought, and it's, it's literally there, there. So, well, but we see also amazing innovative um, circles and communities, if you will, and we have to let all of them um, bloom. We have to bring in more ideas. We have to encourage young entrepreneurs, communities to, you know, live at the edge. I mean, that's what architects like Buckmeister Fuller says, well, you cannot really change old systems. You have to start anew and then hope that inspires people. Similar that what John Hagel says with the center of the edge to say, well, you have to have the innovation at the edge and jump to the next you know, iteration, if you will, and then people will flock to these new ideas, similar that Steve Jobs, you know, you had the Lisa computer and, and let's say everybody on the company was working on that, except these 10 guys over there in the secret thing, which then became the Macintosh. So, you know, innovation of edge and, uh, you know, disruptive ideas in Moonshot Labs or, you know, like our friends at Telefonica Alpha or Google X, um, I think there's these pockets of innovation, whether they're disruptive and, or they are um, smaller in, in communities. So, um, you know, kibbutz uh, in Israel, or, you know, especially the sort of startup nation in Israel is like, what in the desert, let's say literally, you know, they come up with, you know, drip systems for agriculture or what, uh, you know, desaltation plants, they, mankind uh, and our ingenious species, we come up with, in new ideas all the time. And the thing is that um, I think our capitalistic system and economic system needs to adapt to not just like, okay, winner takes it all, but we have to distribute this. So it has to be more common, more community-based. And I feel that we have to come back to some kind of, um, let's say collectives, um, where we see, well, you know, a lot of people in the community of, let's say maybe 150 people, first of all, it's, you know, something socially works well, but if you can somehow control a virus in a village, so to say, and, and, and um, it, it gives you more resilience um, if you work better as a community. And it doesn't have to be all villages. It can be in cities as well. But I feel that, um, you know, I have, we talked about smart cities and, and the cities. We know in 2050, there's the, you know, the data that 70% of the people at least will, be, uh, will live in cities. And we know that every day, um, we as a global citizens, we're building an, a Manhattan. Uh, let's, I don't know if it's a day or it's a month, but let's say, imagine every month you build a new city with the size of Manhattan, boom, 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 boom. And um, all of the cement going in and all of the energy and the people and so on. But all of the, if, if we have this one data, yeah, 70% of the people will live in cities. Well, that means that most of this, all of a sudden, everybody puts all their energy in this rather than, well, couldn't we also not keep some people in villages? Let's say here in Hamburg, um, if you live an hour from now and you can do telecommuting, which was, you know, IBM invented that I think 30 years ago, which we're now living. We're living in a work from home environment. So, well, we could maybe stay also, you know, not only in a city, but live in environments which are closer to the sea, more in nature, better connected to local food, you know, less supply, supply chains and learning from each other and maybe, you know, exchanging eggs against uh, tomatoes or something. So all of that uh, is um, a feeling that I think we have to build, go back to, you know, think as communities rather than corporates or, you know, capitalistic systems. So there's something we have to try and say, how do we get back to some of a new model some might say, well, we had that before. Yeah, okay, let, let's rejuvenate that. And what is sort of the 4.0 version of, you know, working together? Because we know, and we can, you know, I don't want to start that, but let's say if we all invent, oh, we have to catch up on AI. AI and a lot of the robotic uh, systems we will invest in will also mean a lot of free time for a lot of people because we don't need manual work um, anymore. And we will not need, uh, let's say, um, work which is just like putting one paper to the other or filling in forms online or something like that. That's all going to be uh, going to machines. 
So we have to start now. While you invest basically one dollar in AI research, you have to invest at least another dollar in, well, what does it mean for our society? And can we have preemptive policies to see, well, what does the world look like in five years from now if we do that? And how can we prepare the society, our you know, pension systems, funds, investments, as well as our social contract towards these things? And I think right now, Policy is just looking behind. They're like slowing. They're looking at pattern three years ago. They're looking at KPIs and past performance indicators and looking at the past, which is no good indicator of the future. I mean, you touched upon some things that are, are, are very, are very poignant. Um, we, we need to move forward. We need to go through this cocoon. This butterfly effect, this morphosis that they've talked about, and you know, you're answering the question. What's the future? Are we going to go go forward? Also in Songdo, we had this uh, professor Chin um, that spoke to us about Homo symbiosis, the symbiotic Earth kind of a new framework that we're interconnected with uh, all other species and our planet, kind of working and operating within our planetary boundaries. You're 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 answering the question: What's the future? Now for Future IO uh, Institute, what's the roadmap? What do we have to look forward to? I mean, we at the beginning of our conversation, we showed the two books and and that you came out for. Are you, do you have a plan, a roadmap for your advisors, your the people to kind of give them that vision of the future? Well, I think that the um, idea of um, let's say convening is something which I think becomes even more precious. So we um, literally have been um, in the, let's say event industry, if you will, um, and that has been hit hard uh, over the COVID crisis. So we couldn't um, meet actually literally, I think a week ago uh, or two weeks ago in end of June, we would have been in Aix-en-Provence. Now we moved that to October. So we're still planning uh, two meetings um, in October and one in December in Larks and in, um, in X, because I, we, we got some good feedback for people saying, no, you know, yes, we have been in office and yes, it has been, you know, good and rewarding and we have time to think, but we need to meet. I mean, we are social people, so um, we, you live from cross-pollinating ideas, you live from serendipity moments of people you meet, of ideas you can exchange, um, and uh, we try to bring people in a, you know, outside of their daily lives, outside of cities, and more towards um, amazing locations like, you know, our friends from H Farm in Italy, which is close to Venice, which is just an amazing example of um, how can you have innovation communities, literally startups, corporates, and now a university of more than 3,000 people they're building. It's, it's just a place on its own. And once you're there, you see that you know all of a sudden ideas are allowed and uh, which would and, and thinking is just like more natural in a green environment and and um, Italy having some good espresso with your yeah, ideas yeah. so um, I think that's for us um, uh, essential you know we, with the faculty and the amazing people which we put, uh, put the book together and mucho thinking is something which is really helping to prepare for the next decades and thinking ahead and thinking more inclusive, thinking about social impact, ecological impact, even financial impact of you know, your initiative. It's not only thinking on tech. We need to understand technology, exponential technology, so that we can make informed decisions. But we have to have to double think on, well, what's the impact of what we're doing? We don't want to just say, hey, the only reason is, well, look at Airbnb and Uber and some of these, um, let's say, companies which create jobs um, and, and billions for five people, but then five dollar a job, uh, five dollar an hour job for the gig economy. So that's not what we want. It's it's really literally say, well, can we work with the German Mittelstand or the European hidden champions and say there are some companies which are amazing in their transition, like Fisman, for example. It's a heating company, um, and they've been around since more than 100 years. So can we help company like those and their leadership um, in 
you know, and celebrating their 200 year anniversary. That would be amazing. And that's a little bit more what we can learn from, you know, Asia where they have like more a long view on um, innovation and, you know, companies and so on. Um, so the combination of long view plus innovation is something we want to foster. But our, you know, hiatus in um, COVID and our home office cocoon more or less helped us accelerate this. So we are working on a masterclass we announced actually today. And um, so you will be the first one to cover it and is having a masterclass on Mutra thinking, which um, you're part of it so that we bring our um, faculty parts, which are especially, you know, working on Mutra thinking like Pablo, who was a founding CEO of Telefonica Alpha and some other brilliant minds to help in a you know, global classroom, if you will, online and um, see if we can extend our reach, um, which we had with, you know, um, CXOs, Chief Digital Officer, Chief Innovation Officer, mostly in European events and see if we can now scale this on a, you know, make it available globally. So the workshop will launch in September. And um, after that, we plan to have a moonshot on sustainability, which we will collaborate on and, um, you know, some other ideas about more leadership on purpose. So I think there's um, things which we will work on that help spread the word even for, you know, more people and get them more involved and see if we can spark uh, part of a global community, if you will. Um, we still have our European roots and this is um, where, you know, the heart is, but I think we can learn much more from, you know, from China, from Asia, from the Americas, but we can also maybe bring some of our values and say, well, you know, we have to exchange, we have to have this open dialogue and think in a more, as you know, as exactly you say, as this overview effect, we have to collaborate on a global level. So this hopefully um, gives us some, um, you know. Uh, I, I also I'm, like the fact that, you know, that you have that, you, you, you say how important the communities are and, and uh, we need to, um, uh, think globally and act locally and build up these communities. The European Union is, is a strong, fabulous example and a great community, a lot of super innovations. So there's no harm in, in that. I, I, I think the master classes are really needed at this time so that companies and corporations, organizations know um, how to do their sustainable reporting, how to uh, implement uh, environmental social governance into their business models. It's been around for a long time. It started out as, uh, you know, health and safety and uh, uh, environment. Then it went to compliance. Then it went to corporate social responsibility. And, uh, you know, now it's uh, uh, then this sustainability and, and now into environmental social governance. And really the sustainable development goals are, are so important, no matter what your topic is, if it's motivation, if it's innovation, if it's the environment, if it's whatever, the overarching plan that we have for everyone is, um, is the Paris uh, 2030 agenda, the Paris Agreement and the sustainable development goals. And the, the, they are all a system, they all need to be worked on together, but but uh, the one that really ties to the global citizen question and what you're talking about is a 17 partnership for the goals. Not only did 197 countries come together, ratify and agree on the Paris Agreement, but before that, the sustainable development goals in uh, September 24th and 2015. And uh, they agreed that this is the roadmap, the plan, the goal. You know, we don't need to invent something new. We've already got that world's first ever global moonshot and that roadmap, that plan to get there. Uh, we need the tools now. So companies are struggling to understand how to do that and what that looks like and to give them to a master course, a plan, an action plan to implement it, to help us make that transition. As you've said, it's a, 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 and as you've learned o over the years, it's a, it's a, resilient, desirable futures, better business model for your company. It's to show you the way yeah. forward of what needs to be implemented. So and I, I, yeah, I'm, go very ahead. Hopeful. I'm very hopeful because that kind of, let's say, mutual thinking is something which is now uh, being implemented uh, in Europe, especially with a, you know, $100 billion fund or more. It's probably trillions if you will call, count everything in 
that uh, Horizon Europe, which is a new R&D program which starts next year, as well as the Green New Deal and all the, let's say, packages to help the economy getting off their feet from um, this COVID um, stop, let's say, or pause. So I think um, all of a sudden, if you tie in uh, what Mariana Mazzucato from the UCL so brilliantly kind of inspired the EU to now implement, is there actually purpose-driven missions? You know, it's basically the, the European translation for Moonshot, purpose-driven missions. And um, they will not just fund only like, oh, you need, you know, 100 million in R&D for AI. Okay, next year you get 105 million and it goes only to big research departments which live from that, which is, I mean, has been a great streak of innovation. But I think now it goes into goals, uh, which are more, you know, purpose driven. For example, there will be uh, earmarked about 7 billion in the goal. Can we have 100 climate neutral cities <clears throat> is it within the next 10 years by 2030? And the climate neutral cities, if you get the funding, that doesn't say, ah, oh, you have to use now uh, electric cars. It might, you know, it's actually up to mayors or let's say local governments now to say, well, what do we need to achieve that goal? And sometimes it might need, uh, you know, more green paint to depict the bike lanes and uh, inspire more people to go on bikes. As um, um, the, the new reelected mayor Hidalgo um, from, from Paris, you know, she said, well, I want to get rid of 60,000 parking spots in the heart of Paris. Wow. And I want to make it walkable so that within 50 minutes, you have your hospital, you have your work, and you have, you know, all of the clothes and croissants you need and meeting your friends. I mean, this is now very audacious. Sim similar, the mayor of uh, Lisbon basically said, we have to get rid of Airbnb and we have to bring people in, especially nurses and so on. We have to make them affordable to, you know, come back to the center of the city. And yes, we live from tourism, but we don't have to live only from tourism. And we have to kind of have our own balance with a, uh, you know, the better of um, citizens' um, life, so to say. So even if they are not successful within the next two years or so, but this is the audacious goal. This is sort of moonshot thinking. This is unpopular. Um, and this is something which is like, well, it's better for us. And me as a mayor, I stand for this and uh, I want to start it. And uh, we see in France that more, you know, green mayors have been elected. And I think this is um, not only about a party, but it shows hopefully a sign that something has shifted already towards, you know, beautiful moonshots, butterflies, and a, a world where we actually can make these decisions and think a little bit harder about a positive effect. So um, I think um, th there's a lot of hope I think we can see in the Green New Deal, if you call it like this, or even in typical R&D and um, new funds which help, help us. Again, if you have this mission-driven initiatives, there's been new correlation, new cross-pollination, and also you have to upskill leadership people, whether that's you're a mayor or a corporate leader or you're a head of R&D, and that's where we hope we can contribute to a small part and, you know, help um, connect these leaders in thinking moonshot, um, you know, parameters, bringing them together with experts who have din done this since a couple of years, and uh, startups and entrepreneurs who are eager to, you know, play their part in, in all of this. That, that's fabulous because it's so true. I mean, this this book, uh, Moonshots for Europe, that uh, came out uh, last year, we uh, it was kind of a magnificent uh, feat. Uh, uh, I don't know how many months, two, less than two, maybe three, um, was produced and published, and and uh, a lot of collaborators. A fabulous book, but I like oh, how you we bring. Didn't get yeah. three for it. But you and, have to and tell you, story, and you so didn't. Uh, that's right. Uh, you didn't kill a tree for it. So there's a couple mm -hmm. of things. We had a lot of help. The the Innovators Magazine and 1.5 Media also um, helped us with editing, and they're also yeah. helping us with editing the show. And they also do a lot with the UN and Songdo and, and that. And so we we have some great friends, partners, and leaders. The, the thing around this book is uh, in order to give out a book at uh, the World Economic Forum at Davos, they've had for numerous years a paperless policy that there's no uh, paper uh, allowed to be distributed. Um, this isn't paper. This is rock paper. This is crushed rock uh, 
calcium carbonate. Um, so no tree was cut down. Uh, trees, you know, produce oxygen, capture carbon, heal our soils. Um, they do all sorts of amazing things. So we didn't cut those down. And it was pr printed in a renewable printing facility with organic inks. And it's a very environmentally friendly. If you throw it away, it's not going to um, be plastics or hurt or be a waste of, of resources in that respect. And, and it's, it's waterproof. It's, uh, there's so many wonderful things out of it. So it's a new innovation, but it's chock full of tons of innovations from cover to cover. It's a beautiful, well, well published and written uh, book from so many wonderful contributors that not only are we talking about the innovations and the moon, moon shots for Europe and the moon shots for the future globally, but now we're giving people an innovation in their hands, something that this is the 10th book in the world that's printed on rock paper. Fabulous uh, thing and fabulous partners and collaborations. I love how Future Iola, I love how you are connected as an influencer and a leader to bring world leaders and people together to, to see that new vision of the future. The Sustainable Development Goals is the exact same thing. It's the plan, it's the roadmap to 2030. It's, uh, it's our way, it's our future. It's in, ingrained in the Green New Deal. It's ingrained in our plan uh, globally for, for most um, good leaders, you know, uh, Merkel and the EU and, and others to, to help us get there and reach that. We have um, talked about this before, but in order to reach them, we need six uh, major transformations. And um, you, you mentioned in your discussion before that you know, AI and emerging technologies, uh, the jobs of the future will be different and that uh, we won't be doing maybe what we're doing now. Um, there are so many different transitions and in infrastructures that need to be built. You mentioned Volkswagen and how uh, they've got to do a new operating system and they've got to convert to all electrical and, and hydrogen, different types of things emerging and coming out. But there are so many jobs in this transition to build that renewable infrastructure to build. That's why it's called sustainable development. Development is developing infrastructures and, and uh, countries, communities, and cities. There are a lot of jobs available. There's going to be a lot of uh, gaps in industries to clean up all the metal scraps and how do they convert the airplanes into electrical planes or use a new jet fuel. How do they do that? How do they not strand those resources? I mean, you and I know it very well and remember the when the Berlin Wall came down right at the border, there was tons of trabbies. People would drive them to the border and then no more gas or they'd break down and they were just stranded there and there, you know, for, for years um, until they were, they were cleaned up and, and uh, that can't be part of our transition. We need to have repurpose those metals and those materials. So there's plenty for us to do wonderful jobs, wonderful opportunities to help us to reach that goal. So it's a very hopeful and optimistic and it's not uh, the doom and gloom. You know, that's why I asked you this, question, you know, WTF, are we going to go from, from face masks to gas masks to oxygen masks to spacesuits? No, we're, we're going to create resilient, desirable futures to get us there. And I, I believe we're totally aligned on, on those futures that we, we present. As uh, probably the second to last question I have for you, and it's a big one, and I pre-warned pre you, you, you mostly answered it in some way or the other during our conversation already. What does a world that works for everyone look like for you? I don't want to know what it looks like for me or anyone else. I want to know what it looks like for you. Uh, and it'd be mm. nice if you could tell us how, how we're going to get there. Hmm. Um, well, I mean, of course we have, I think maybe our own personal dreams of how we would uh, spend more time. I think um, we are living, and, and then there's sort of, oh, what's a systemic change for everybody? Um, I think the mix of that is, is not an easy one. It's something, you know, but I think you asked the question the right way because we all have to feel this agency and empowerment that, well, if we 
you know, show something, an example, you know, we might inspire others or we might inspire exactly the opposite, which works for other people. If it works for all at the same time um, and for our planet in a positive way, there has to be sort of a lab of ideas. And that's in a way my, my vision is say, well, I think it works if, you know, we have, first of all, the planet and our, our you know, co-living citizens and friends and neighbors in mind uh, that that uh, our impact uh, that we generate with how we live is uh, not hurting or disturbing anybody else but with in general we have sort of a positive effect whether you have a good relationship with your neighbors or your you know co2 footprint is positive if not you compensate and uh, work on that you know you know reducing plastic in your house and these kind of things i think for me personally um, building a bridge between more, uh, let's say, rural communities, having a lab in nature where you can help contribute with, you know, planting trees maybe in a, in some way or form, and um, inviting people to give a space of innovation and learning. And uh, this kind of a living lab is something, you know, for me personally would be uh, inspiring and, uh, you know, desirable to spend time um, that we have right now. We are we're working from home since four months almost right now and uh, somehow it works. Yes, we miss um, quality time and this becomes even more precious. So if we go on an airplane and if we meet people, we will make extra time to it. So um, in, hopefully in times and environments where we don't need the mask anymore soon. But even that, we have to be careful how we, you know, threat as a social um, um, animal, if you will, and um, seeking these connections which are healthy and uh, not um, toxic to us, um, as well as so once we have this kind of, you know, our level of friends, our level of um, cooperation partners we work with, um, I think this is something uh, which we can inspire to. And you can, you know, obviously do that in a city where maybe you live in a neighborhood which is more inclusive and which is more open and which is more culturally diverse which you know helps everybody to grow and and uh, you know find their potential and uh, i also feel i'm just um, you know fond of working together with young people you know my daughters are a fantastic age to you know learn from each other and um, i think we almost have to you know sidestep if you see you know the american election which like two 75 year old guys uh, have to battle out and i mean this is not the world we you know really see this is futuristic so i think i rather want to see can we help you know everybody who is 25 to 35 right now and have an you know exponential step forward to leadership and have some kind of a working together where you know young and older people mentor each other from well this is the world we know and this is the world we want to dream and how can we help navigate together? Um, and this is sort of something I would love to explore more and um, you know continue to learn from other <clears throat> you know people around the world. Uh, continue some travel in a meaningful way, but also um, actually you know live in an environment where you know we can live a lab. So our first camp uh, and campus here in Hamburg as a kind of a work balance on the water in the harbor um, was a fantastic ride and um, now we find a new place and see if this is some maybe something we can do in an environment where you know maybe there's more sun or more uh, ways to explore this in nature so that's great thank you um, that, that that is an important part to have this uh, lab and experiment. I, I, I want you to know and our listeners to know that unbeknownst to us or whether we, we knew we were doing it, we've been running a big lab and an experiment with fossil fuels on our planet for a long time. And so sometimes there's <clears throat> the question, do we want to run a lab? Do we want to experiment? We've been running a big experiment uh, for a long time using fossil fuels and uh, emitting greenhouse gases, which is affecting our planet, um, uh, which is uh, turning out to be a very negative uh, consequences for keeping us within the safe operating space of our planetary boundaries. And so I believe that uh, the way you conduct your labs and the way you conduct those 
future innovations, there is sustainable innovation. There is a way to do it clean and with a renewable and closed loop circular economy principles so that um, if it should fail, if it's one, uh, not a model that works well, that you've still um, protected everybody and, and kept that in, in the safe confines uh, of our planetary boundaries and operating space. And so for the future, it's really how we operate and how we produce that's really important. Are we producing efficiently and into the future? Um, as a par parting thought uh, for our guests and listeners, is there any message if you could go up to each person individually and say, this will change your life or this is what you need to hear from, from Harold, what would it be? Um, <clears throat> I think one of the most inspiring books and thoughts um, or books um, has been the last um, lecture. And um, it's uh, from a professor, it just escapes me, but we will put it in the link. I will, uh, fabulous. Um, and it, it, let's say if you think about the end of your time, and this is what also Steve Joff said, uh, that you know, once he became more aware of his limited time, not only when it was, he was sick, but just like from his um, learnings and studies, is that you have made, you know, once you know your time is limited on this planet, you have to make it more meaningful. And, um, you know, we have, you know, I'm 50 plus now and uh, you'll be soon. Yes. <laughs> so um, that, that means that, you know, half of our life and maybe more is already over. So. Um, I think this kind of notion of, well, make your time worthwhile. And uh, this is um, something which I don't know, struck me. And I think if you have this idea plus, well, you can make a difference. You are a futurist. You are somebody who has to think in a way more collectively within your network, your family, your neighbors, within your corporate. You could be the one who's nagging in each meeting and say, hey, I think we should stop this plastic. Can we not innovate on our product and make it without plastic? And can we not be, you know, in our town, the one first factory, which is CO2 positive or, you know. So I think that it all comes to everything we see around us uh, is made from people. It's made from a designer. It's made from somebody who had an idea. It's made from a, I don't know, a light bulb was 1,355 times or more has been failing as an experiment. And then the one time, you know, it changed our lives. And uh, for one person, it was a light bulb. And for everybody else, it's electricity and access to learning. You can read a book and study at night and so on and so forth. So, each of our little steps have this, you know, in a way, again, butterfly effect. And yeah, if we effect. see and we have, uh, millions of butterflies uh, bloom, this is a world I want to see that, that everybody has, you know, this beauty in mind. Um, you know, Tim Leberecht, our friend, says this also so well with this like beautiful uh, romantic society and romantic business. Um, and it means like, no, it should be somehow you should feel good about what you do. You should feel good about the company you work with. You feel good about the influence you have in the world. And um, it has, can be a small step. It can be an act of kindness, uh, which our friend Diana is studying in her uh, PhD study. And, um, you know, a smile in the morning or, you know, an apple a day and, uh, you know, uh, less car driven miles every day this every little step helps and i think most people think oh it's only somebody above has a plan and uh you know the politicians run this and they have all the experts no i mean we our collective energy that's what we have to bring together and i just that's exactly if we meet with just 100 some people in at age farm or at the camp in in in, uh, in exxon provence this literally changes people's lives because you have all of a sudden you have the feeling you're not alone everybody has an impact in what they do and can be more meaningful. And if we push them that that impact has a little bit more daring effect, all of us can benefit. And so it's up to all of us and every one of us to be the change. And, um, you know, that's only what I hope for. And I see a lot of good signs and um, connecting with friends like you, the faculty and, and uh, people around the world giving feedback and, and, you know, calling in and doing a Zoom call to check on each other. That's, I think, what we have to live for. It's this community 
um, aspect and it can just start with one and one other person. So like this conversation, thank you very much for You're having so me welcome. and the time. I mean, this is uh, just the quality time we need. Yeah, the, the Randy Pausch, the last lecture, live every day as it was your last and every little step and action counts or make it count uh, and that uh, know that you are not too small to uh, to have an effect because we are all crew members on this spaceship earth we're not passengers we're not just along for the ride we can actually steer and guide it and our future is the way we would like to have them be so uh, I love you, Harold. You're a good friend, and I, it was so great to see you. And thank you so much for being here with me. And and uh, I'll put all the links in in, in the video below. And uh, I wish you all the best. And we'll be seeing each other very soon for the master class. Exactly. Thanks so much, Mark, and to all the listeners. Thanks for hanging in there for an hour plus. You're fine. That's uh, what it's about, the deep dive in substance. Thanks so much, Harold. Take care.